Welcome back to another episode of the Pack-A-Day Podcast. I'm Andrew Murdig filling in for Andy Herman. Please like and subscribe our YouTube channel. You can get all your Pack-A-Day updates by following us on Twitter at Pack-A-Day Podcast. So I'm here tonight to talk with you a little bit about what happened in day two of the NFL draft. And of course, the Packers kicked off the second round by dealing picks 59 and 53 uh, to the Vikings for pick 34 to move up and nab North Dakota State wide receiver Christian Watson. So before I jump into the analysis of Watson, I wanted to discuss what this trade actually meant. The reports out there said the Packers were trying to move up to pick 32 to take Watson with the Vikings late on Thursday night. Uh, The Vikings didn't want to give the Packers the opportunity to get that potential fifth-year option for another player, especially a wide receiver, so they balked at that. Uh, Well, they ended up taking the same deal on Friday, Uh, and so now technically, if you use the old trade chart, the Packers could have gotten up to pick 27 by using the two second rounders that they had, so the Vikings did get a bit of an advantage in this deal, but if the Packers really valued Watson as that next wide receiver, they needed to be willing to overpay slightly to get the deal done, especially considering that it's a division rival, so I don't mind that quite as much um, when it comes to overpaying for moving up. Uh, I personally had Christian Watson as my wide receiver for my overall 22nd player. So, um, you know, what do I think about him? I I see him as a little bit of a limited route runner, um, as most big receivers tend to be. But he has a really nice ability to make sharp cuts and use his body to shield defenders. So that gives me optimism that there is a bunch of room for improvement in that area. I really like his hands and the ability to go up for the deep ball. He's going to be a red zone threat uh, even right away. There's some good juice with the deep speed. He's got some shiftiness for a guy his size. He played in the slot a little bit. His run blocking is a plus. He's pretty fun with the ball in his hand. You you see him even lining up in the backfield at time for, for North Dakota State. So this is a really fun prospect who played a really versatile role. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, the big thing that you're going to see with Brian Gutekun's draft picks crazy athletics, right? Uh, And Watson is no exception. He has a 9.96 RAS score, relative athletic score. Um, You saw at some points that he had a a perfect 10. Um, There were some adjustments to the numbers, but still just an incredible upper echelon athlete. So you're talking about a freak athlete amongst the freakiest athletes um, in, in the world, really. And so you know, his closest comp athletically is actually Kelvin Johnson. So, yeah, uh, he's in pretty elite territory. Uh, he measures in, measures in at 6'4", 208. He did 18 bench reps. He ran a 4.36 40-yard dash at, at 6'4", 208. That is absolutely unheard of. He had a 2.45 20-yard split, a 1.45 10-yard split. So we don't talk about those metrics very much, but those are crazy elite ath- athletic thresholds. I, I mean, the, the Packers just had to be going nuts for this guy, um, and, and thus the aggressive trade-up. His shuttle and three-cone, I would say, are more good than great, but you'd expect that from a guy who has really long strides in, in such a big frame. Simply put, Watson has elite upside so early on probably a guy who's going to take the top off the defense Um, they're going to generate some touches for him for sure he took handoffs like I mentioned before returned kicks in college I don't think we're going to see much of that but he will absolutely be a threat in the quick screen game somebody who can block enough to stay on the field so um, you know maybe it's not so obvious that they're going to throw the quick screen to Devante with Lazard lined up in front of him maybe they can do a little bit of a switcheroo on that he's got the potential to develop into so much more than just a quick screen run on the nine kind of player and I think he has the maturity to develop a really quick relationship with Rodgers I'm, I'm thinking like Alan Lazard did right Lazard was in camp and just caught Rodgers Rogers' attention, developed good chemistry there. I think Watson has that kind of maturity to his game and something that I would expect to see. Um, So really, really love that pick. Of course, I had him at 22nd overall. Uh, There's a lot of people that really love him. Uh, You know, shout out Ross Uglum, who who probably is more familiar with Watson than anybody who covers the draft period. Um, And and he was certainly a big, big advocate for Christian. Uh, And then we waited a really long time for the Packers to pick again, very late in the third round. So we, we had an early second round pick and then a very late third rounder. And the Packers selected Sean. 
Sean Ryan out of UCLA. He played left tackle there. Uh, he's a guard at the next level, in my opinion, because of his lack of length. He, he's really smart. He passes off um, any games, any stunt action really, really well. Love that. Uh, that's something I think he has in common with a lot of these players that we're seeing the Packers pick in, in this middle of the draft on the offensive line. He has enough anchor to sit rushers down. He's going to create some movement in the run game. He's a fluid mover, and I really like that element at the next level. Probably better against the pass early in his career because of the spread at UCLA. Um, I think more advanced blocking te techniques are going to take a little bit of time for adjustment. Um, but I personally had Ryan listed as interior offensive lineman 5 and overall player 91. So where he was drafted at 96, really right in the range where I had him ranked. Now, I, I have some positional value in the metrics that I use to gauge where a player is going to fall in my final rankings. So if you switch him from an interior offensive lineman to a tackle, that is going to bump him up pretty considerably. And so when I, when I hear some of my my uh, colleagues uh, around the Packers Twitter sphere talking about Sean Ryan maybe as high as 50 in the 60s, I think you know if I had analyzed him as a tackle instead of an interior offensive lineman, I think that's he probably would have landed right in the 60s or 70s for me as well. So a really highly thought of player. I think the Packers got good value there. Uh, he has an 8.18 relative athletic score as an offensive tackle, but you switch him over to guard and he bumps all the way up to a 9.35. So you see that elite athleticism that Brian Gutekunst values and, and certainly the Packers fall in love with. Um, you know, great burst based on his jumping numbers. I, I really like that. Um, that's something, you know, people don't always pay attention to how, how offensive linemen jump, uh, but that shows a lot in that springiness, and I think getting that initial burst in the run game that showed up on his tape as a result of that. And he posted a ridiculous 7.553 cone for an offensive lineman, which is just really great. Um, if you look at him as a guard, Brandon Scherf is one of the athletic comps, probably the closest one, um, you know, People don't always turn out the same as a player just because they're athletic comps, but Brandon Scherf, certainly one of their more athletic guards in the league. And so you really like that upside for him. I think you give him a shot at right tackle and then let him fail to a really good guard. I, I, I think you have to do that. Um, so it'll be interesting, him and Royce Newman. Um, I think John Runyon Jr. is a little bit more solidified as a starter, but you, you may see Sean Ryan competing for a starting spot right away as a rookie. I think if him or Newman can play right tackle, you take that, you let them pinch hit there until Elton Jenkins is healthy, um, and then you figure it out from there. But I really like this pick. Um, let's just hope the Packers' third round curse is over because Ryan has a legitimate chance to be another really, really good offensive lineman for the Packers coming out of the middle rounds. Uh, so I wanted to just take a look, um, you know, other players that stood out or other picks that stuck, stood out on, on night two. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of division rivals uh, coming up here at pick 42, the Vikings get cornerback Andrew Booth Jr. So they traded down a bunch of times and they finally sprung back up uh, and they get one of the corners that I really, really valued in this draft, Booth Jr. out of Clemson. He was my 11th overall player, uh, so I thought very highly of him. I'm not sure what caused that slide, but um, I think the Vikings really settling in and, and addressing that cornerback position that has been so difficult for them uh, out of the draft. And unfortunately, this is a pick I, I really appreciate uh, coming from Minnesota. At 48, the Bears got safety Jaquan Brisker out of Penn State. I think he is a really good value playing next to Eddie Jackson, and um, I, I think that's going to make a pretty solid safety duo if Jackson can return to form at all. We know he needs a solid player playing next to him, and I think Brisker can provide that. At 52, the Pittsburgh Steelers got wide receiver George Pickens, who I know a lot of Packers fans, including myself, uh, really, really liked Pickens. Um, the, the Steelers have just nothing but success in developing young wide receivers, and they handle off-field issues pretty well for an organizational standpoint. So, um, you know, outside of Antonio Brown, and that was something that sort of they just jettisoned him, um, the, the Steelers tend to handle that really well, and uh, Pickens could just be another in the line 
um, of the that wide receiver factory that comes out of Pittsburgh. At 63, the Buffalo Bills got running back James Cook, who I was absolutely infatuated with. Man, I had him as running back two for quite a bit of, of this draft process. Um, I think he's just a fantastic multi-threat running back and a fantastic fit for the Bills offense. From a receiving threat, um, I think he makes all the sense in the world, and he's going to provide a lot of versatility. Probably a name to watch out for for uh, those of you who love fantasy football, James Cook, uh, the Buffalo Bills. At 74, of course, the Falcons uh, finally stopped the run and take QB2, and that ended up being Desmond Ritter. A little bit of a surprise there. Um, I know that on the NFL Network broadcast, they compared him to Marcus Mariota a little bit. I, I think that's a little rich from an athletic standpoint. To me, Desmond Ritter's a little bit more like Ryan Tannehill. Uh, which is interesting because Tannehill, of course, kicked Mariota out of his starting spot in Tennessee. Um, and now the Titans' former offensive coordinator is the Falcons' head coach. And so you're bringing in Mariota, and now you're bringing in a guy who could be the next Ryan Tannehill uh, to compete all over again. Um, I, so I, I do think that's really interesting. I think uh, the Ravens at 76 got defense lineman Travis Jones. And, you know, Jones was my 21st overall player, and I, I say this nonstop. So people who, who are familiar with me probably would want to say, like, please stop. But Travis Jones um, is just yet another example of the Ravens sticking, picking, and just taking a great player that falls into their lap. Like, over and over and over. How good is this draft class for the Baltimore Ravens? Uh, you're talking Kyle Hamilton, Tyler Linderbaum. Now you get Travis Jones. Um, it, they, they just do such a wonderful job uh, of drafting in Baltimore. And then at 86, the other quarterback, uh, my, my QB1 goes all the way down to 86. The Tennessee Titans stop the slide there. Um, Malik Willis is going to get younger uh, or get their quarterback room younger and cheaper. I think this is the beginning of the end of the Ryan Tannehill experience in Tennessee. They've sort of reached the ceiling of what they can do. Um, and so Malik was my 16th overall prospect. Uh, certainly the NFL didn't value him the way that I did, but the upside there is, is tremendous. And so if he can sit for a year behind Tannehill and then maybe, maybe come on either very late uh, or sometime next year in that sort of Lamar Jackson role um, of the running first quarterback who also has a huge, huge arm, and then maybe he develops some accuracy and, and becomes a really big threat in the NFL. Uh, so I like those picks. Those are the ones that stood out. Certainly a lot of talent still sliding into day three. Um, we're going to see, you know, I, I would imagine the Packers will maneuver around a little bit more, but as of right now, they have two picks in the fourth, several day three selections. And excited to see where they go because we're, we're going to see them, you know, maybe take a look at addressing the few needs that are still out there, tight end, safety, um, but then depth that is going to be valuable special teams players and really, really interested to see what happens on Saturday. But that is all the time that I have for today. This has been the Packaday Podcast. You can find me on Twitter at Andrew Mertig. Remember to also follow at Packaday Podcast. Please like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, also, if you're into the audio version, I'm typically on on the Friday crew with Kyle Fellows, Maggie Loney, uh, so feel free to check us out over there. Uh, be sure to stay tuned to the YouTube channel. Um, on Sunday, we're, we'll continue breaking down what Green Bay does. Uh, this time it rounds four through seven, so um, please stay Take a look at that. Thanks for listening and watching. And as always, remember, go pack go.